I couldn't help but notice that you've clicked on and are presently listening to an episode of the Paranormal Patio Podcast. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your support. And if you want to continue to support us, the best thing you can do is share our episodes on social media. That's right. You can tag us in everything. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find us on ParanormalPatio.com, where you'll find articles, links to information from our past guests, as well as, uh, you know, every episode as it comes out. Also, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash beyond the patio. You can get a monthly live stream, at least one, sometimes we do more, exclusive bonus content, early access to all of our episodes, and starting with season three, I've got to move season one to the archives. So they'll be on Patreon as well, and you can listen to them there. Thanks again for your support, and uh, hey, let's get into the episode. What kind of weird thing are we talking about today? On this episode, I'll be chatting with AJ Lunn, and this is kind of a unique situation. This was the first sort of swap cast type thing that we have done with this show. I was on AJ's program, which you'll get to hear about here very shortly, and uh, then we took a break, and he came on to my show, The Paranormal Patio, right here. Uh, If all things worked correctly, our episodes will come out on the same day, and you'll be able to get a link to my appearance on Mysterious Creations in the show notes in the description of this episode, wherever you're listening to it right now. But that is a big, tall order uh, for the two of us. As you're going to find out in this interview, uh, AJ and I share a very uncommon problem, and we'll get into that. We're also going to talk a little bit about a Bigfoot experience that he's had and several encounters with spirits that he has had, as well as his preservation project, Mysterious Creations, and his house fairy, and his cat Merlin, and his wife, Sarah, who will make an appearance at the end of the episode. AJ and Sarah are both, uh, I would consider them both good friends. Um, I chat with AJ very often, and uh, Sarah is, well, I mean, I know, I know you guys, I know what you're doing. You're sharing the Patreon account, and that's okay. Sarah is a patron (laughs) right here at the Paranormal Patio, patreon.com slash beyond the patio. She's the official member. But I know that they're both there. I know that they're both listening. And that's fine. And that's great. And uh, I love them. And I support them. And I thank them for their support. Anyway, this is a fun little interview. And I think you'll enjoy getting a lot of insight into uh, AJ and a little bit of insight into myself. And I really look forward to how their project blooms in the future. I think they have some pretty grand aspirations and enough motivation to see them through. And I'm really excited about it. And I'm excited to bring this episode to you guys. You're listening to the Paranormal Patio Podcast. Welcome back to Paranormal Patio. As always, I am Jason. Yeah, you guessed it right. Same guy. I'm still here. And you're still listening. So, hey, thanks. Uh, Tonight, I am joined by AJ Lund, and we're going to talk about his project that he has going on. We're going to talk about all kinds of weird things. I have a feeling. And we're going to get a little bit more of a background on AJ. He's probably in one of your circles if you're in one of my circles. So, you probably will know who we're talking about here. But, anyway, at any rate, AJ... Welcome to the Paranormal Patio, buddy. Thank you, Jason. I'm glad to be here, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Had a flu shot, felt like dirt for a few days, and getting back at it now. Getting back at it now, as only the good Canadians can. Yep. Get her done. <laughs> there you go. Now you fit in down here. See? You could easily <laughs> immigrate. It's, yep. it's no problem. Uh <laughs> Well, before we dig in too deep into into some of the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight, I'd love for you to give everybody listening a little bit of a background about you as a person and about this project that you're working on, because I know it's a big passion project for you, and I definitely want to give you the time and give you a piece of my platform to help spread it around, because I think it's great. Great. Uh, well, I'm a regular guy, just the same as you. I work uh, the night shift at... Uh... At a grocery store. I'm not going to name the store because uh, I don't have permission to do so. I've been a cook most of my life. 
I went to uh, school for engineering, architectural engineering. I've done quite a few other things. I've been quite a few other things. Most of my life, however, I've been practicing magic and Buddhism. Um, Buddhism actually came to me through martial arts, which has been a lifelong passion. That's what I would describe as my religion, is martial arts. It gives me more peace doing that than anything in in my life uh, I've found. And my project, uh, Mystier Creations, we're doing a uh, preservation project where we are preserving cultures, history, science, folklore, and, of course, high strangeness, which is why I'm talking to Jason today. <laughs> we'll get into the weird stuff in a little bit, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. With this project, um, I normally I would say, you know, let's let's talk about it at the end and, and promote your stuff at the end of the episode. But let's kind of dig into it just a little bit and explain some more of it and tell people where they can find it now. That way, whenever... Because I know this from experience when two podcasters get together, we we tend to veer away from veer away from, from the important it. stuff, and we just Talk enjoy cool stuff. yeah, we just enjoy the conversation. And so I yeah. want to make sure we get this totally out for for our peace of mind. So let's let's go ahead and knock this section of the uh, of the format out, and uh, let's right. dig into it a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about you. Kind of give us the brief rundown, right? But like yeah. what this what this looks like to someone who is going to stumble across it or click the link that is in the show description right now from yeah. this episode. Right now, it is a podcast which uh, we discuss uh, many topics with many many people. We kind of pick people that are doing important projects to the world today, uh, as well as historical projects. Uh, I've talked to Ethan Siegel, who uh, is a physicist. I've talked to Dr. Irving Finkel, who is a philologist and a seriologist uh, from the British Museum. The, the, these two are just examples of the project. We are trying to preserve all of human knowledge in our project. You can find that at mysteriercreations.com. That's M-I-S-T-E-Y-R-E creations.com. And it'll take you directly to it. It's also going to be on all the major platforms, including Apple, which I didn't really want it to be on, on Apple, but they did it, so I'm going with it. You're going to bring those words in here and into the paranormal uh, I know. patio. You're I, killing I me. Want, I want... I wanted to do the same thing you do because I don't really agree with them, but they did it, so it's there. As long as it's free, I'll be okay with it. But when they start charging for it, that's when I'm going to say, okay, you guys got to pull it because I'm not going to have people have to pay for the knowledge that I'm disseminating on uh, Mystery Creations because my idea, my wife's idea, is that this should be free to everyone to be able to listen to and and read because well really the start of the project came into being when my wife and I started looking into our family histories and we found that the people we come from the history of them was romanized at best and a lot of it has disappeared because we're from uh, the the Gaul Celts and there's a lot of information out there, but it's not all accurate and it's not all specific to those people. And so when we were looking at that, we said, well, we want to open a business. Originally, it was going to be a restaurant. But when uh, we watched Hellier, it spurred all of this into this project that we're doing that's become our lives it's it's a passion project I'll, I'll i'll leave it at that i can totally relate for those of you who are unaware we just flip-flopped here so i i just interviewed for aj's show that he just yep. talked about and he asked me how how hell you're impacted 
my life and and this in my work and uh yeah it's it changed everything in the sense that it it totally created everything that i've worked on i mean it it brought me i've always had an interest in the paranormal it brought me back to it after stepping away for so long and without it i wouldn't be doing this show saying and clearly without it you wouldn't you know be taking the path that you're taking either so it's true and it all happened because of a chance finding sarah found uh traveling uh museum of paranormal on on uh youtube and said what's this hell your thing let and and watch the first episode and then said aj you have to watch this we've been into paranormal stuff the whole time we've been together uh it, we started our friendship on on this stuff. So that wow, that's seventeen years ago now. It's interesting to uh, to see how how your has affected your life and our life lives. Yeah, for sure. It's not and just that, us though either. I mean, it, it's tons of people. <laughs> tons uh, of people it, pretty much everyone that watches it they either say ah whatever and, and, and walk away from it and then there's the others like us that it completely affects and changes the path of our our lives yeah did you want me to get into the weird stuff now <laughs> we'll get in we'll get into it in a bit before we started recording we were having a little conversation uh, we were kind of just talking about, started off talking about your vaccine because I needed to test your your levels on on my end of yeah. recording, and yeah. uh, we kind of we kind of dove into uh, some like personal health things, and I was fascinated to to hear you know more of your story. I I kind of knew uh, you had, we had yeah. talked about it before. AJ and I yeah. talk, we message a lot, but hearing hearing it all like kind of lumped up. If it's not too personal, I think that a lot of people will be very interested in in knowing how how you think and why it is that you have to think that way. When I was born, my mother and I both our hearts stopped, and in the process of that, I was brain damaged. It affected how how I developed. When I was born, I was born blind they didn't find out that until i was about six months old and, and realized that i wasn't able to see right and my my eyes had crossed severely and so they did an operation that allowed me to see and then from there we fast forward all the way all the way to 14 where i uh, had an experience i ate uh, a donair that was prepared on bleach and bled internally for for a month and passed away and i was gone for about 7 minutes again i had brain damage from that and had to learn to speak again because instead of see instead of thinking in words i think in images throughout my life it's been kind of that way because i've i've been dyslexic most of my life all of my life, sorry. So when I speak to people, which is why I speak slowly, I see images that I relate to words. And if I don't have a relation to that word, it takes my mind a bit to come up with a word that matches the image. So fascinating. It's just a quirk of who I am. That's how I grew up, basically. It's it's very helpful in doing visualization work in magic, as well as uh, as doing meditation itself. Uh, I can I can kind of void the images or focus on an image directly and keep that. Uh, it's I do a, a meditation called the apple meditation, where you set an apple in front of yourself. You look at the apple, you prepare yourself, you go into the meditative state, and then you allow that image of the apple to be in front of you spinning, and you look at the apple, and you focus on that, and it allows you to kind of, well, it gives you focus on it, but also it connects you to the apple. And then you take the apple, you eat it visually in, in the meditation, 
and plant the the core and then you let that core grow you become part of the part of the plant in the seed form you grow up into a tree and then the apple falls from the tree you grab the apple and look at it and then open your eyes and eat the apple that doesn't prepare you for not wanting to eat the apple afterwards <laughs> <laughs> because you will not want to eat that apple because you're so connected to how that is and for me that that is a real experience for other people it'll be more metaphysical for me my, my in my mind i see that whole experience as images it's like a movie playing so that's basically how how i i see things it's incredibly fascinating and i had asked you if it was a struggle for you because it seems like to someone without that disadvantage or, or advantage, I suppose in this case, someone who has to interpret and enunciate things in a different way, it seems like it would be a struggle. But for you, it's the way that you've been and it's just how you are. Yeah, you would struggle if it were the way for yeah. you that it is for, for, for me, you know? So it's fascinating because uh, I've never spoke with anyone that has had this type of thing like where you think in in images in that way and i find it totally fascinating that that's that's why when i do my artwork there's so much in it because i'm putting what's in in my head it's like writing a story right and a lot of, a lot of times i'll say something and people will be i don't understand what you're trying to tell me and it's because they aren't realizing I'm thinking in images. They're thinking I'm thinking in English. And it's basically like I have to translate my mental language to English to speak to you. Yeah. And so sometimes that creates a disparity of uh, me relaying the, the, the information to the person. And you had mentioned how it actually aids you in your magical work. Um, can you talk more about that? I know you kind of talked about the meditation side of it, but kind of dig into that a little bit more. Well, with magical workings, you're visualizing your intent. And to me, I can create a physical representation of my intent in my mind when I'm doing the the. If I'm doing ceremonial magic, I do it verbally and physically. I can I can kind of bring images out of myself and look at them in that in that way. It's hard for me to explain it in words, but it's like I can physically see the item that I or the intent of my magic as I'm doing it. Most often it'll create an effect. To give you a specific thing, during last year's Harvest uh, Festival, we did a, a, a dedication to the ancestors. And a part of that is a meditation where you allow an ancestor to come to you. Because I see things in images, I can see it clearly in my head. And when I did this, the image of a black buck with a colorful blanket laid over its back. Uh, it kind of looked like a reindeer. It walked up to me, and it was eating snow just before it walked up to me. And it touched its muzzle to my, to my mouth. And I could feel the wet cold of the muzzle on my mouth was a physical experience in that way. That happened six months ago. When when I get those images, it stays with me. Where if you're speaking in words, that can that can dissipate over time. So that that's where it aids me in, in magic. I think you're giving me a lot of credit saying that it only dissipates in time because it dissipates as soon as it leaves my mouth. <laughs> it's gone. I've uh, already forgotten what I've it, said. <laughs> it, 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 
with uh, ADD and stuff like that, Sarah, my wife, has problems with with memory because of ADHD. Your short term memory is crap. Yeah. Because of because of that, it, it like you would have to repeat that same thing a dozen times or more before you commit it to memory. In that way, words are like that to me. I, they're in, in one ear, out the other. Mm-hmm. But if you have my attention and I'm speaking to you, you have to, when I'm speaking to you, if you don't face me, your words will go out, out of my head real quick. But if you're facing me and I see your mouth moving and your facial expressions, it commits it to memory. See, I need a trick so, like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. It's It's really hard. And... Half the time I, I get yelled at for not listening and it's because they're not facing me so I don't get that mental image. Mm-hmm. And if I don't get that Im- mental image, I can't remember what they said to me. Yeah, I get that. I think one of my struggles with my memory is that I also at some point, uh, well, not at some point, I know when. When I was around 12 years old, uh, I was riding my bike to my grandparents' house and before I crossed the street to their driveway i looked both sides of the road check for traffic and in the process of me crossing the road at kind of an angle you know maybe 30 feet uh from one side of the road to the opposite a car came around the corner and the woman driving it was late for work and she was going about 45 on a 25 mile per hour road uh clipped the back of my head with her side view mirror and flipped me through the air through my bike, probably 20 yards, I remember getting up and she came out of her car and asked me if I was okay. And I remember at 12 years old swearing at her and saying, what do you effing think? Of course I'm not okay. You hit me with your car. And the next thing I remember was about 45 minutes later, uh, I was in my grandparents' house and uh, the police were there. I remember I was drinking some of my grandmother's sweet tea and I had like 50 bags of ice on my head. And since then, my short-term memory has been atrocious. Brain injury, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Going through school, I didn't bother studying for anything uh, because to even know what I needed to study, I really just had to be super focused in class and, and really try to commit it to memory. And once I did that, I didn't need to, yeah, I didn't need to do the late night cram session or anything because it was already there. So everybody would be panic studying, you know, in between classes or whatever. And here I come all cocky and arrogant, just walking into class, getting my A, going home. Uh, (laughs) But so, yeah, I I can relate to to the memory problems for sure. I've gotten really good at committing things that are important for the most part. I do forget sometimes. But conversations you might as well just pretend we didn't talk about it, <laughs> which yeah. makes makes podcast editing a little bit more fun for me because whenever I go back and listen to this episode, I will have already forgotten what chance. we talked about. So now I get to listen yeah. to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, and it, it's, it creates a, a memory as well because when you're editing, you're, you're repeating it. So you're able to commit a lot of the, the important facts to, to memory. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. AJ, we are in the paranormal patio, and we've touched base on a few little mystical things here and there, but largely, we've just been griping about, you know, our brain injuries. and (laughs) Brain injuries, yeah. (laughs) Uh, So, you told me this story, uh, you know, a little bit of it, whenever I was on your show. Could you tell us about this Bigfoot encounter that, or not so much an encounter, Bigfoot uh, witness that you bore <laughs> on the side yeah. of a mountain? Uh, it's called Christmas Hill, specifically. My wife and I climbed to the top of it, and there's a place called the, the fairy, fairy Ring. And I saw this eight, nine-foot-tall being walk the whole length of that field. And there's tall grass there, a number of trees, which is how I can kind of say... Because next to the tree where this thing passed under, I couldn't reach to where its head was. And I'm I'm five foot one. When I reach up, I'm close to six feet. And it was at least three feet taller than that. Wow. So, 
and uh, but it walked the the entire length of the field, crossed behind the tree and disappeared. We witnessed people walking the same area just before that, and you would see them going the whole length until they get into the dip area and down down in, and that goes well beyond that tree. And when it disappeared, I wasn't really panicked because I, I, it was so far away from us. But when it disappeared, I kind of went, okay, where is this? Because that thing is big. Speaking about my brain injury, I don't have fear. That's other interesting. People have, other people have fear. I don't fear anything. If something scares me, I'm more likely to go towards it than run away from it. Wow. So I know I should be moving away from it, but I will go towards it. So you know the appropriate response, but you yeah. totally ignore it. I totally ignore it most of the time. And I've had to teach myself not to do that. It's an uh, actual physical effort not to confront what scares, what should scare me. I say it scares me, but it's more a feeling of exhilaration than a feeling of, I got to run away because this th could kill me. Yeah. Point point of fact, when I was five years old, I climbed a 300 <clears throat> meter cliff that's sheer and scared the hell out of my parents. They, they thought I was going to die. I had no fear of it. I don't have fear of, of that. Now, the one thing that I do still have fear of is unstable structures. I thought you were going to say your wife. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> even even though she can be scary when she gets mad. <laughs> so unstable structures do it to you, huh? Unstable structures scare the hell out of me. So what I've kind of physical out. reaction do you have if you say say you went up in a, in a in a man lift or a scissor lift yep. and you are at the max height, they're pretty shaky. What physical yep. symptoms would you have from that? Uh I get a little bit of vertigo and my heart starts to beat a little bit fast. But other than that, it like I know that this structure is not safe. It's a mental thing, and I can see the possibilities. Like I said, I, I think in images, I can see the possibilities of something failing and me careening to my death. Yeah, that is that's interesting. Yeah. I don't have a fear of death. I have a fear of near death. I'm Okay. I'm afraid that, for example, if I'm up high, I'm not necessarily afraid of heights. I'm afraid that I'm going to fall and somehow survive more than I am yep. that I would die. Not that I am on a constant suicidal binge or anything like that, but I'm comfortable and, and, and prepared enough mentally, emotionally, uh, that if I knew I were going to die, I would be okay. But if I knew I were going to live with a severe possibly permanent Bill handicap, too. you know, I don't want any part of that. So that's my biggest fear for, for me personally. Uh, but I do worry, you know, about family and things like that. We, we talked a little bit on your show about uh, yeah. me getting into a situation where I had no means of communication and I was completely alone. And, yeah. you know, that was scary to me, but not for a personal for a personal reason. Scared for your family. And I suppose, yeah. Anyway, so we, you, you've seen this Bigfoot disappear into this field. Uh, what other sorts of encounters with the unknown would you say that you've had? Many. Oh. <laughs> in, innumerable. The first name I ever spoke was Alice, which is my grandmother, who died seven years, or sorry, ten years before I was born. She died in 67. I was born in 77, and the first word I spoke was Nanny Alice, and mm -hmm. that was, I had no way of knowing that, right. and I would always babble on as a, when I was a baby in my crib to something. My parents never knew what it was, so that was my first experience with paranormal. I don't really remember that, but that's what they told me. Can't get much um, earlier than that. I mean, that's pretty much, yeah. you know, right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hate piano because of uh, a spirit that would play the electric organ in the house. And it was a malicious spirit. The guy who owned the house before us was kind of a not a nice guy. 
and he would play the organ. And so now when I listen to piano music, I, I'm not really keen on it. Was it but just I'm the getting... music that scared you? Or did he do something else while playing the music? What was it that was scary about it? He would, he kind of looked like a, 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 a demon to me. Okay. I had no concept of what a demon was at that point. I was right. too young. He was just a real evil person who was hateful. And loved piano. Yep. Loved playing piano to scare me. <laughs> <laughs> and then right from around four or five, I started noticing UFOs over the house and asking my parents, what's that? And they would say it was a UFO. And they'd appear every every few months. And daytime, nighttime, didn't matter. As soon as we recognized that they were there, they'd uh, just whisk away uh, at high speed. It, like, it's there, and then you'd see a blur, and then it was gone. And it was usually an oval, almost almost an orb shape. Around that same time, I had health problems that were was caused. Now, this is my memory. It may not be true. My parents thought that I had rolled over in my sleep and touched my belly to uh, to an electrical socket because it kind of looked the same. I had a burn mark on my belly that I remember these three orbs of different colors in my bedroom, and it was like they were fighting each other. And then one of them touched me and burned me, and I flipped my lid. I ran to my parents and said, it burnt me, it burnt me. And they looked at it and they said, okay, we'll take you. They they doctored the burn. I was able to function. I wasn't slurring my words. I wasn't acting weird. So they said, we'll take him to the doctor tomorrow. And then the next morning, I had an uh, appendix attack. Got to the hospital and then all of a sudden, three hour, three or four hours in, the appendix pain goes away, and they find that my appendix is fine. Really weird experience there. Yeah, how did they explain that? They they couldn't. They looked at the burn. My parents said that it was an electrical burn. They said maybe the the shock to the system caused the the symptoms or a problem with my nervous system and caused the appendix attack. That's the only explanation they could give me or give my parents. I remember it my way, but they they were convinced that it was an electrical socket that uh, that did it to me. But I remember it differently. Going forward throughout my life, I've had experiences where uh, I've witnessed ghosts. Like uh, there was a building being torn down across from, from our house. And I saw a woman in the window, and I I started I ran down and told them to stop tearing the bu building down. There's a woman inside, so I, I'm yelling at them to stop tearing down the building. There's a woman inside. They checked out the building. There was no one in there. So I get back up to the house, and she's sitting in the window still. And I yelled. I went back down and said, "There's someone in there." Turns out the woman that lived there had died three months before they tore down the building. She was getting evicted, and I guess she just took her own life in the building. And I was seeing her spirit. Wow. Yeah. And then another experience I've had was a Haitian man yelling in my face. It was uh, in October uh, 2009, and I was going to work. I think it was close to, to October 31st. It was close to, to Halloween. And I'm standing in in the bus stop waiting for the bus. It's snowing. And it's like 5, five in the morning, so there's hardly anyone around. And all of a sudden, I feel a presence in front of me. And this guy starts yelling at me in Haitian, telling me to get get get, get out of there. Um, I had to look up the words. I, and... and and that I can't really remember remember what exactly the words were, but he was yelling at me in Haitian to get away. And at that point, I wasn't really thinking. I just scared the hell out of me because I wasn't 
quite awake. I could actually feel the warmth of his breath on my face. Yeah, you, you can explain that by saying, oh, a warm wind, but it was October and snowing. <laughs> and the wind's not going to be that warm. So he yells in your face and then does he just disappear or what? It just it just faded away. The feeling of the presence faded away. And then I remember thinking about it when I got to work. And I said, okay. In that same area, just down across the way, uh, is a park, which used to be Africville. It was where the people from the, the Underground Railroad that came through Halifax, Nova Scotia, that's where they settled and had a community. So there was a number of black families that lived there and were ousted from their homes uh, because the government decided it was not a safe environment for them because they weren't living in modern homes. They were basically living in shacks, but they were their homes. Right. And so that every year we have have a march about that in Halifax. So I, I expect that it was a Haitian man yelling at me to get off of it, get away from his home. And I think that's that's what he was saying. Get away from my home. Get away. How did and you recognize that it was Haitian? Because I, I have a few Haitian friends who who uh, would speak Haitian around me. Oh, okay. And so I, I – well, I'm working in, in restaurants. Uh, you have Haitians, Jamaicans, Ecuadorians, Filipino, African-American, African, Africans from Africa. So you have a mix of everyone and depending on, on the restaurant. Greek restaurants, which is where I work predominantly. Uh, you'd have a mix of everyone. I have an Egyptian friend because of that, uh, Nas. He uh, he was a cousin to to the owner, and uh, so I I learned a little bit uh, to recognize languages that way. Yeah, I wouldn't know Haitian uh, to hear it if it beat me across the face. I don't think <laughs> that's why I well, asked. <laughs> It's uh, Haitian. Haitian is uh, French. Sorry. If you if you hear anything, it's uh, Sarah doing some dishes. Yeah, tell her to be quiet back there. Tell her I don't appreciate it. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not coming through too badly. Ah, uh, it'll be okay. So beyond being screamed at in Haitian in the wee hours of the morning, uh, <laughs> where does where does your paranormal experience go from there? To. Uh... Everywhere I go, I feel the presence of spirits. In every apartment we've been in, particularly in Halifax, uh, when I moved from my family home to our first apartment, there was a man in the apartment that would stand and stare at us. Sarah recognized him before before I did. He would stare at us through our, our door to our bedroom. And one morning we got up. And all of the cupboards were open. So he could physically interact with things. Come to find out, uh, a man had committed suicide in our apartment. We found that out afterwards. And then we moved across Canada to uh, to Victoria, B.C. And Victoria area is very active. Sarah's making noise. Sounds like there. there's something active right behind you. Yep. 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 Her, her, and and the ever-present Merlin, the cat. <laughs> I flashed a sword in the stone uh, with the dishes all clanking together, and Merlin <laughs> using his magic to clean the kitchen. That's what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly it. <laughs> Just here in this apartment, we have what we call a house fairy. So this is recent, recent stuff. We have a house fairy that communicates with us in different ways like it'll mimic merlin it'll do his little chipmunk style whiny uh chirps and uh and meows it's mimicked sarah saying my name a couple times but it would take the form of a butterfly white moth and it's been off and on for years so and it's the same moth with the same coloring, which it couldn't be physically a moth. Have you ever tried to capture it when it's a moth? No, no. Um, but it did land on my hand once when I was doing a painting. I think I've talked to you about that. Yeah, I think you're right. I was doing a painting of a forest 
and it wanted to be in the painting. So I put a little image of, of it in the painting. And as soon as I had finished doing that, it landed on my hand. I got the feeling, a feeling of and image of happiness from it. And then it flew off and, and we haven't really seen it physically since, but we've had experiences with it being in the house. It'll pick up and move stuff every once in a while. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, I had the the Sasquatch experience up on Christmas Hill here. Do you think that your ability to sense and see this spiritual energy comes from the fact that you've almost or, or were technically dead several times? Or do you think it's something that inherently you might have just had anyway? I think it's something that came came from the death experiences. When we die, we go to basically everything. It's hard for me to explain in a physical sense. I can see it, but I can't put a word to it. What you see when you die is a connection to everything on an energetic level. And when I came back from death, this is something the average person ignores. Uh when you're young, you you have that connection. As you get older and you become more engrossed in society, I think we lose that capability, but it's always there. And I think the average person always has it. In my case, the death experiences have allowed me connection to that well beyond that level. So it really... I think it enhanced my ability to sense those things. And do you think because Um, of the enhancement to your ability that it allows your wife, for example, it affords her that same, that same gift of being able to to see and interact with these things. Like you mentioned, she recognized the guy in your apartment and, and things like that. And she's also familiar with your little house fairy. Do you think that's because of sort of the pull that you have sort of through that veil of energy? I think at times, our, our proximity, yes, but I think the specific times that she's had her own experiences, they have all been with her directly. Okay. She she's had her own experiences, and I can't, I won't speak directly to to those. I'll let her no, sure. yeah, her yeah, do yeah. that. You can oh. go ahead. Okay, can... she she just gave me permission. I heard it. It's on audio. Yeah. <laughs> Back in Indiana, where she she lived. There was a vortex in her bedroom. She had gone to a haunted house. Uh, it's a state hospital. I can't remember. It's torn down. It was a mental state hospital. Something came home with her. That night she had a really weird dream where something was saying, put a spider in it. <laughs> and then fast forward many years. She's in Nova Scotia. She's in my uncle's house with me. She had a... a a weird dream about witches and turns out just up a, a ways from where we we were living there's a native burial ground where reportedly there was a native uh, witch doctor buried there i did, i've never told her that <laughs> <laughs> i've never told her that she knows it now so her dream could have been related to that. Fascinating what comes out when there's a microphone in front of a person. Yeah. I Well, if I'm not thinking on it, the images won't be in my in my for, the forefront, so I won't remember it right away. But if I'm thinking on it, on that experience, it brings back the, the images and allows me to think of all the things. I think it's a mixture of everything. That's caused my abilities to become used. If I never tried to use any of my sixth sense, so to speak, I wouldn't be able to use it. It, it would, if you don't use it, it kind of fades. Yeah. Kind of like what we were talking about on my recording earlier. You kind of lose the ability to use these thing, these things uh like uh astral projection if you don't you do it all the time you lose the ability to do it and you have to relearn it or reconnect to it well aj we're getting close to time i'll just give you uh you know however many minutes you you would like to take to again promote your stuff and uh 
any final words that you might have and then uh you're off you're off to go play with your house fairy and uh help your poor wife clean the kitchen yes <laughs> yeah she's she's get, getting us ready for work with her squeaky fridge <laughs> thank you very much for having me on the preservation project mystery creations you can find it everywhere online twitter facebook Instagram. We have a website, mysteriocreations.com. And in the new year, we're, we're looking at uh, creating a nonprofit for the preservation project itself. Hopefully, I can get you some information on that uh, in the next few months uh, so you can uh, post that in the, in, in the links. Absolutely, I will. Yeah. Uh, of course, the link will be in the description for this episode. And on if. paranormalpatio.com. So you don't even have to spell it. You can just click it click and it. learn, which I find is the best way. AJ, thank you so much for coming on, man. And thanks for having me do your show. I'm, depending on when these come out, I will probably put a link to the episode of your show that I did in the description for the episode of my show that you're doing right now. Excellent. All right. Well, enjoy your night at work. Uh, tell Sarah, hi. You're very hi. loud in the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you later. You guys have a wonderful night. Uh, be safe up there and uh, enjoy it. Same with you. Until next time, keep the fire going.